So what I'm going to do tonight is I, I'm going to uh, give you some history about St. Patrick and his times. And I'm going to go into some detail about um, about what Ireland was like at the time, uh, how St. Patrick came to Ireland to begin with, and uh, what his life was like, really, a, a kind of a, a biography. Uh, I'm going to talk about why he returned to Ireland and uh, then I'm going to look at his legacy. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up a PowerPoint presentation and then you can follow me on that. Okay, so you all should see a slide here. Uh, it begins with a quote from one of the writings of St. Patrick. Uh, the writings that we have of St. Patrick are some of the earliest writings that we have from Ireland. Uh, we don't, there isn't uh, copies of his actual uh, written work itself. It's from copies that were uh, dictated about 200 years later. Uh, and one of the writings uh, is called a Confessio, which was the closest to an autobiography that we have. And I'll be explaining the significance of it later. But it began with, I am Patrick, a sinner, most uncultivated and least of all the faithful and despised in the eyes of many. So I'm going to be unpacking a lot of that. Uh, as I said, I'm going to be teach, uh, sorry, I'm going to be uh, telling you the history. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with, with Patrick through some of the legends and myths. I'm not too sure how much history you will have got. I know that for a lot of, you know, my, <clears throat> even in Ireland, we didn't get a lot of the history. A lot of it was a Christian narrative, uh, which was built on a variety of myths. So I'm going to talk about his family. And the main reason for that is that his family are often left out of the picture. And I'm not going to leave them out because they're very important and significant. So who was he? Well, first thing to know, he wasn't Irish and he wasn't, his name wasn't Patrick. His name, in fact, was Maywin, it's a cat. And he got Patricius when he became a, a, a priest. Uh, he, basically, he was made a member of the patrician order, um, and as a result of that, you could call yourself Patricius, and then in, that got translated over time into, when it became anglicised, into Patrick. So he was from a Romano-British uh, Christian missionary fam family. Uh, he was known as the Apostle of Ireland, and he's the primary patron saint of Ireland, along with Saint Bridget and St. Columba. The, we're not sure where he was born, even though he mentions it in, in his writings, uh, no one has ever been able to quite, you know, a, 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 a establish and get agreement. Some people claim it was around Scotland in a place called Dunbarton. Some say Wales. And some even say it was in, it wasn't on the island of Britain at all, that it was in uh, Brittany. So, uh, but I believe it was uh, on the west coast of Britain. That's the most likely uh, place. His parents were Calpurnius and Concessa, and they were part of a wealthy Romano-British family living in Britain. And at this stage, the uh, Britain had been taken over by the Romans. Um, when Patrick was, was born, it was over, the, the Romans had occupied and controlled Britain for a little over 300 years. Um, so his father was a deacon and his grandfather, Potitus, was a priest. Uh, there is evidence that some of his siblings and their offspring worked alongside him in, in Ireland. Um, for example, St. Mel of Arda. Uh, you may have heard of the Arda chalice. Um, so St. Mel and his brothers, Melchu, Munis and Rioch, they actually accompanied their uncle Patrick when he came to Ireland. Uh, the second time, and I'll be explaining that as I go along. Now, the most famous of them all is his sister, Dererka. Uh, she's known as the mother of saints because most of her children, 17 sons and daughters, entered a religious life and many were later recognized as saints. And several of her sons were bishops. Um, to this day, she is honoured uh, on the 22nd of March, and she's the patroness of Valencia Island, which is off the coast of County Kerry. St. Mel is, would be, in terms of, uh, I suppose, fame, he would be next to Dererka. Uh, he came, as I said, with, with Patrick, and he helped to evangelise Ireland. Um, and at the time, um, it was customary among 
um, many of the church people to support themselves through labor, although that wasn't universal. There were there were some who came from privileged backgrounds and wanted to live a privileged life, but they weren't likely to be the ones that would ever come to Ireland. Uh, if you wanted a handy life, an easy life, you didn't come to Ireland. Uh, Patrick appointed Mel as one of the earliest Irish bishops and made him head of the Diocese of Arda. Um, Mel was also involved and instrumental in the building of the Monastery of Arda. And he was both the bishop and abbot. And again, uh, the, in, 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 in Ireland, we had, if you like, two kind of parallel uh, traditions. One was one that was based uh, around the Roman church and diocese, and the other then was around monasteries, which was uh, a kind of a, a, not so much a competing element within the church, but one that was distinctly appropriate for Ireland, because Ireland didn't have uh, cities. And Ireland wasn't available to be carved up into dioceses uh, in a way that uh, the Romans would have been able to do in other countries. One of the things that he's famous for um, is that he he was the one who accepted St. Bridget's uh, profession as a nun and he served as her mentor. Um, back in those days um now in, in in ancient gaelic society women had uh, particularly women of the nobility would have had a lot of uh, privileges and would have would have been would have would have would have had a status well not on a par with a man but but certainly nothing compared to the uh the situation that that women in the in the middle ages uh, faced when they were totally subordinate and essentially just the property of their husbands um, but even in, in those days, uh, it was difficult for women if they wanted to make it through the, uh, uh, you know, into the church and up. In the old Celtic society, women did and could, and there was uh, no problem making your way up to professions in, in, in old Celtic society, even to be, um, even to be a warrior. Uh, but anyway, uh, when Christianity came, a lot of that uh, changed. Um, there was a lot of opposition to women uh, becoming, in, uh, particularly in, uh, women who would become important in the church and play leading roles. Um, so she had a, a difficult time uh, being accepted. And it was Mel, he was the one who accepted her desire to be a nun and to be uh, setting up convents and establishing orders. And in fact, some people considered the, the work of St. Bridget and a lot of the women um, that uh, she brought into the church as uh, possibly one of the main reasons why the church uh, developed so rapidly in Ireland. Now, St. Mel, um, believe it or not, he, there's a feast day for him and it's February the 7th and it's observed as a holiday for single people, uh, basically a day for single people to celebrate the good things about being single. And traditions include sending yourself a St. Mel's Day card, and for people to host parties for their single friends. So now uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail about Patrick himself. Um, so Patrick came to Ireland as a slave, and he was there for six years, and he made his escape. So I'll give you the insight on that. And we know this from his own words. And according to the Confessio, uh, uh, that's the Latin word for confession uh, of St. Patrick. At the age of 16, we believe around 403 AD, he was captured by uh, Irish pirates from his home in Great Britain. And he ended up in Ireland and he ended up as a slave herding and tending sheep in Dal Riada. Uh, he was owned by uh, a king, a local king. Uh, Ri is the Irish word for king, Miliuk MacBon, And he ruled over some hills in County Antrim. Now, the reason that he was captured by Irish pirates uh, has to do with the fact that um, the, in Ireland uh, at this stage, the vast, basically, um, you know, the vast bulk of people that were there were Celts. Um, a lot of them had arrived in Ireland uh, as a result of losing out in the war with Rome in the five to five hundred to a thousand years previous. Uh, so they knew they knew uh, what Rome was all about what would happen to them and to Ireland if the, the Romans ever took it over. So their strategy to avoid that was to unite with the people in Scotland and various other people around the west coast of Europe. And they would keep the Romans busy fighting so that they didn't really have time then to come and bother people in Ireland. 
that's it in a nutshell. He tells us, uh, you know, that when he when he when he came uh, out in the hills in all kinds of weather, he began to pray. And he tells us that this was something new. He had never before paid much attention to the teachings of his religion. And in fact, he tells us that he didn't really believe in God and he found priests foolish and he wasn't really setting himself up to continue in the family tradition. Here's where he was. That's Slamish or Sleeve Mish in County Antrim. And it's up there that he spent the best part of six years. Uh, so, as I said, he ended up there following his capture and being brought to Ireland. And he was there from the ages of 16 to 22. And that's uh, important because those were the years when he would have got uh, his the equivalent of his high school and uh, college education. I mean, we're talking about 1600 years ago. But if you were a member of the elite in those days, you got educated uh, to the highest levels. And if you wanted a career in the church, you had to... Uh, you had to um, get, you know, very, very well educated. And so that was a problem. And it became to be something that haunted him for the rest of his life and nearly, nearly, nearly made, nearly made it impossible for him to uh, climb up the hierarchy within the church because they viewed him as not fit for the job because he hadn't, uh, he hadn't, uh, he hadn't got the basics in education. So anyway, he, he endured all six years and as many of you will know, that was kind of cold and damp and he, he was in isolation. And the Christian narrative tells us that on, on his last night as Miliuk's slave, he, he received in his sleep his first otherworldly experience. Uh, a mysterious voice said to him, your hungers are rewarded. You are going home. And apparently, uh, he tells us he walked uh, about 200 miles to a place on the southeast coast, probably Wexford or Waterford. Um, now, that's the Christian narrative, but it, it doesn't, it, it, it's not the history. What, what really happened was at this stage, the High King of Ireland, uh, you may have heard of him, it was Nile of the Nine Hostages. And it was a, a raid uh, involving that involved people who worked for Nile of the Nine hostages uh, that were responsible for bringing Patrick to Ireland in the first place. And he didn't come alone. There were thousands of people that uh, were kidnapped and brought uh, to Ireland. Now, what happened uh, around this time uh, when Patrick escaped was that uh, the High King, Nile was assassinated. And he was assassinated, uh, apparently, in the Alps uh, when he was fighting the Romans. And he was assassinated by an Irishman, uh, a prince from Leinster uh, that um, had been basically stalking him for years, trying to get an opportunity to kill him. Now, Nile was not only one of the most important and strongest kings ever in Ireland, but at the time he was well known throughout uh, Europe. So his debt, which came as a, a big surprise, um, it was, wasn't something that people were expecting. The result of that would have been political turmoil and chaos within our, in Ireland. And there would have been a lot of people looking for opportunity, uh, for instance, his sons and his sons, um, which they probably would have inherited a lot of it from him anyway, eventually. But once he was dead, they set out uh, to take over the territory that would have been their heritage eventually. It also meant that um, there was a big shakeup. And it's my belief that it was in that kind of chaotic situation that Patrick was able uh, to escape. It's also likely that uh, he got help. Uh, there probably was uh, the equivalent of an underground railroad uh, in Ireland at the time. If you were kidnapped and brought to Ireland uh, from, from England, the first step would have been to offer a reward uh, or ransom. And uh, sometimes that worked, a lot of the times it didn't. But there would have been ongoing attempts uh, by the families and friends and communities to reach out and try to you know to connect up and get you back so that would have been uh, there would have been uh, if you like a community that would have been involved in supporting those efforts and i'm sure they helped to get many a person out of their slavery 
what we're told <clears throat> uh, in terms of the Christian narrative was that uh, he was never intercepted, stopped or otherwise approached. And that begs the question why. And that's why I believe that he was ushered through this network. And he wouldn't have said anything about it when he was writing because, you know, just as in in this country, no one was going to write and, uh, you know, and pinpoint people who had helped them or even acknowledge possibly the existence of of something like that. Uh, he explains, he says, I came in God's strength and had nothing to fear. Uh, but even the you know the Christian uh, some of the some of the Christian narratives tell us that um, that there was possibly you know what's described as an underground railroad. Now we do know that when he was in Ireland for the six years, he became fluent in the Irish language. He learned of Irish culture and history. He figured out the political and economic uh, conditions in Ireland and figured out how to get things done, as we'll find out later. And also, he apparently developed an affinity towards the people of Ireland to the extent that he wanted to return. Um, at the time, uh, when he arrived at the coast, he he approached the uh, the captain of a, of a ship that had a cargo of Irish hounds that were going to uh, to the continent, probably to, to Rome, because Irish wolfhounds and various Irish hounds were very much wanted by the elites uh, in Europe at the time. Uh, he initially approached the captain, but it was turned away because uh, for anyone to take on board a, an escaping slave, that was a serious offence. But in the end, uh, he tells us that the sailors came looking for him uh, and said to him, come on board, we'll take you in trust. That's what we get from Patrick himself. We also know that he travelled for three days, and he, and what he tells us as well is what they found was devastation. Now, some people, uh, if you read about Patrick in some books, they'll tell you he went to England. But it doesn't take three days to get to England. And there's nothing in the history of that period that would explain devastation on the island of Britain. But there certainly is a good case to be made that it was to uh, France or Spain, which would have taken about three days. And we know that particularly Gaul at the time, which would be modern day France and, and beyond, uh, had been devastated, had been devastated as a result of Germanic tribes being forced westwards and um, there was a few very, very cold winters which allowed people to cross the River Rhine uh, and they invaded the Christianized areas. Um, and that meant that a lot of the Christians in Gaul had to evacuate. And some of those, a considerable number probably, ended up in Ireland. Um, so he tells us then that after about two weeks and finding nothing to eat, uh, the captain taunts Patrick, how about a Christian? You say your God is all powerful. And Patrick tells us that he turned to him and said, from the bottom of your heart, turn trustingly to the Lord, my God, for nothing is impossible to him. And apparently the, the sailors bowed their heads in supplication. And with that done, heard a pig stampeded in front of them. So there was no way, there was no way they were going to eat any of those dogs. Those dogs were more valuable than the men themselves. So you all heard the story about snakes. Well, you probably know at this stage that, again, that's a lot of rubbish. Uh, there was never any snakes on Ireland and Patrick didn't. But my take on it is this one here, um, that when Patrick eventually left that group of people, he tells us a few things that I haven't got time to go into in detail. One is that he was actually kidnapped again and it took him, a, uh, a, I think it was two, two weeks or three weeks to escape. But we do know then that he planned to get back to Britain, to his family, and he would have went around the coast rather than coming back across the land because it was devastated. He had seen that. And also there was a better chance on the coast of him getting onto a boat that would bring him back to Britain. On his way, he would have come across uh, the, uh, the abbot, Honoratus, who at the time was constructing a monastery on the island of Lairns, which is in modern day Cannes, where the big film festival is. The reason that he got the land was because no one else wanted it, because it was uninhabitable. It was full of snakes and uh, reptiles. And in one book about the place, um, by, written by Hamilton, she says, Honoratus was winning a reputation for driving its booming population of vipers into the sea. And she writes that it's not impossible or unreasonable to assume that he, Patrick, might have sought refuge on Lairns. And just as an aside, if you look at the middle of that name, uh, it's got Aaron. Now, whether that's a total coincidence or what, I don't know. But anyway, my guess is that uh, 
years after when Patrick did arrive in Ireland uh, and as they went around working and building communities, they would have been sitting around in the evening talking. And I'm sure he had lots of stories to tell himself. And he was probably amusing people by telling him about his job on that island. And uh, as we know in Ireland, you know, stories just grow and grow. So there's a connection there with snakes and it may well be how we get the story today. The one thing is for sure is that the story that we were told that he got rid of snakes in Ireland uh, is untrue. He got rid of uh, paganism or uh, he got rid of some pagans anyway. Anyway, he got home. He tells us that his family were happy to see him. They wanted him to stay there and get involved in the family business and pleaded with him to stay and never to go again. But at this stage, he well, within a relatively short period of time, his mind was made up. He wanted to uh, build a future within the church. Uh, and what he what had happened to him up to this had changed his life forever. Sometime later, he again had another vision. And as you know, from the Old Testament and New Testament and rest, it was quite common for people who became uh, senior within the church uh, to be able to explain a lot of things through visions. Um, now, today, we would probably say uh, that um, he was having a bout of homesickness. Um, so anyway, this is how he describes it. This is the way Patrick describes it. I saw a man coming, as it were, from Ireland. His name was Victoricus. So he knew this person from Ireland when he had been in Ireland and he carried many letters and he gave me one of them. I read the heading, The Voice of the Irish. As I began the letter, I imagined in that moment that I heard the voice of those very people who were near the wood of Foclute, which is beside the Western Sea. And they cried out as with one voice, we appeal to you, holy serpent boy, to come and walk with us. So now um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Christianity in, in Ireland. A lot of people will, uh, have been told and were led to believe that uh, up to the time that Patrick arrived in Ireland, there was no Christians. Uh, that's not uh, the case. Um, that was just a simplified narrative. Uh, it it, 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 it uh, avoided having to go into detail about other things and it was a simplified story. Now we do know certain things. Uh, there, 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 there are people who believe that St. James visited Ireland in the first century and that on leaving he left behind an organization uh, to spread uh, the uh, religion. Um, now in Ireland, St. James is very popular. Um, well, we know St. James's gate because St. James's gate is the entrance to where Guinness is made. Uh, but, uh, you know, for from the 8th, 9th century up to the probably the 12th or 13th, people met at St. James's Gate um, as they set off on a pilgrimage to Galicia in Spain uh, to commemorate St. James. And he also built a hospital, which is still there today, called St. James's Hospital uh, in Dublin. And there's, a, 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 there's a, at least two major churches in Ireland after St. James. Uh, now, my friends in the uh, Arch, Archbishop's House in, in, in Dublin um, will tell you that St. James never came to Ireland. That's the official line. But there's lots of reason to believe that he did. Now, we also know that early Irish Christianity was from the teachings of St. John, uh, who spread the word of Christ to Africa and Asia. Um, now, St. Paul and St. Peter were among the Christians who were based upon in, in, in Rome. And uh, eventually, when Rome, when the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, uh, Rome became the center that everybody had to, if you like, show allegiance uh, to. But there were differences then between the teachings of the different branches. And that was reflected in, in Ireland as a result of James and John. Uh, for instance, the tonsure or the haircut that priests had was different from the one that was uh, was required from Rome. Also, the dating of Easter was different, and that was something that uh, was a very, if you like, a very lively topic within the church for hundreds of years. And just even on a, a kind of another note, if you like, the two most famous names uh, in Ireland have always been Sean, August, Seamus, which is John and James, not Peter and Paul. Um, now, there's other things as well that we get from the annals, the old Irish legends and annals. For example, at the time of Christ's death, uh, 
the story is that the High King at the time, Cormac MacNessa, uh, he had a, a military, he, he had military forces in Ireland, uh, in 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 uh, in the Middle East, fighting against the uh, Romans, and one of them was a prisoner of the Romans, uh, a person called Conal Kernock, who was a military commander. And the story is that on the day that Christ was crucified, the Romans brought out a representative uh, from every nation in the world uh, to observe it. And this guy, uh, uh, Colonel Karnak, was the representative of the Celts. Um, he returned to Ireland and uh, he went to, and he informed Cormac of what happened. Cormac, uh, hearing the story and hearing how uh, he, he, was, he was already aware of who Jesus Christ was, but hearing what happened to him, uh, he got into a fit of rage and got up and ran outside, ranting and raving. But unfortunately, Cormac uh, had uh, a piece of shrapnel in his head from uh, some battle and he loosened it and he got a brain bleed and he died. Um, so that's what happened to Cormac. Then another Cormac MacArt, who, who died in 366, uh, he converted. It is said he converted to Christianity. The Druids weren't happy about that and they poisoned him. And Cormac MacArt was one of the most um, celebrated high kings of Ireland forever. Also, uh, before St. Patrick arrived, there were already a number of Irish Christian leaders like Alby, Declan, Ciaran and Ibris, all of whom are now elevated to sainthood. Um, now, the some of the early Irish Christian development um, is explained by the relationship of Ireland to the Roman uh, Empire. Um, as I said earlier, the people in Ireland uh, were Celts uh, and their relationship with Rome uh, was not a good one because they had been fighting because before the Romans, before Rome was ever built and before the Roman Empire ever became established, the Celts had been uh, if you like, the main group across Europe. And they were defeated um, in the centuries before Christ by the Romans. And they were aware of what the Romans were about. And as I said, it, it gave them plenty of motivation to do anything they had to do to prevent the Romans coming to Ireland. Um, now, the first few centuries uh, after Christ, was one of persecution of, of Christians, um, and it ceased when uh, Constantine became emperor of Rome in 313 AD. And uh, by about the year 250, the, the Christian population had risen to about uh, 2 million, and the period from 250 to 300 was uh, of the worst persecutions of Christians. Now, Constantine was based in Britain, and when he decided he was going to become emperor, uh, he was going to have to fight uh, for that. So he needed soldiers. And because he was in Britain and the next country to him was Gaul and they were Christianized countries, so he needed to recruit Christians. So it is my belief that uh, in order to get those Christians to fight for him, he had to make a deal. Uh, and the deal would be that if he won, he would put an end to the persecution of Christians. And that's what, what happened. And eventually, uh, long after uh, Constantine was dead, um, although there was a dynasty because his son followed him, but eventually in the 380s, uh, Christianity was made the official and the only religion of the Roman Empire by the emperor at that stage. And in terms of a timeline, it was around then that Patrick was born. He was born around 386, 387. Then Germanicus is then sacked uh, Rome in 410, uh, and at that stage, then Rome had to withdraw its soldiers from Britain, and that was the last time that it did that. They had uh, an occasion to withdraw them before, but they'd always brought them back. But this was the last time that the... Uh, the and then in 476, uh, Odoacer forced the last Western emperor to abdicate. Now, it was in 380 then with the Edict of Thessalonica, uh, made what was initially nice Christianity because one of the things that Constantine, Constantine had done was uh, brought together all of the Christians at Nicene, which was the first uh, council uh, of the of the church and all after that. And at that stage, they just called Christianity the Nicene. Uh, but in 386, they introduced the term Catholic, which meant universal. And from, it was a Instead of, being, instead of being Nicene Christianity, it became Catholic. Um, 
and that provided the impetus of the leaders home uh, various branches of the church around the world they had the means now with which to do uh, they were allowed uh, to work within all of the the state federal bodies so they had a lot of power which they didn't have for the first three centuries one of the events that happened uh, before came to Ireland a few years before it in 429 uh, the Pope sent Germanus uh, to Britain to ensure compliance there with Roman authority because even though uh, the uh, the Roman Empire had adopted uh, the, the the church in Rome uh, there were still other branches of the church if you like uh, competing and in England uh, there was a variant uh, which Rome wanted to get rid of so Germanus's job was to come and put it to the, to the Christians there that you uh, are going to have to agree with the he well he had a deal you know for, uh, in in terms of the way forward and so it looks like the majority agreed with his deal those that didn't uh, were sent into exile and some of those would have come to Ireland. So if we look at who were who were the Christians in Ireland at this stage. And this stage we're talking about around the time that Patrick. So some of them would have been those eggs I talked about. Some would have been slaves brought to Ireland. Um, uh, if they were slaves that were captured in Britain and Gaul, they would have been mainly Christians. There's the possibility also that Irish mercenary soldiers fighting for Rome, and there were some who were fighting against Rome, uh, they may have converted while fighting away. There was trading going on. Um, and maybe some of those as well uh, converted. And then there was uh, people in Ireland who had been converted by the missionaries that predated uh, Patrick. Then we had, uh, as a result of the, of the Germanic tribes invading the Christianized Gaul, there would have been a lot of people who were forced out and would have arrived in Ireland. Some of them as refugees and some of them as asylum seekers. And um, they brought a lot of resources uh, to Ireland. Um, they brought skills. And in fact, uh, the population of Ireland uh, around that time uh, grew to its highest level that wasn't surpassed for another 1,300, 1,400 years. Also, the, uh, in, the, in the centuries that followed, in the 6th, 7th and 8th century, Ireland was known as the island of saints and scholars. Ireland had a renaissance, while the rest of Europe uh, which was decimated by the uh, Germanic tribes coming in. Uh, and that period in Europe is known as the Dark Ages, but in Ireland we had a uh, renaissance. So now I'm going to look at how Patrick converted the Irish. And there's a couple of quotes uh, in terms of his own perception of how he was going to get on. He says, daily I am expecting to be slain or set upon or reduced to slavery. Now, Cardinal Cushing, many of you may have remember Cardinal Cushing from his days in Boston. In his book, he talks about this period and he says it was in an era of alarming crisis that Pope Celestine I sent Patrick to Ireland, an era of confusion and disorder and chaos. And that's precisely what I've been describing to you there. It was the uh, Europe that Patrick found when he uh, landed as he escaped from slavery. Uh, it was the Ireland from which uh, a lot of refugees and asylum seekers uh, came. And there was also difficulties and problems with inside the church itself. And of course, the Roman Empire itself was in what we would talk about now as a terminal decline. So what was Patrick's role then? Why did they send them? Well, first of all, the, the year before, uh, they had sent somebody else because Patrick still hadn't managed to convince them that he was entitled, if you like, to do the job. Uh, his background as such and his education didn't really qualify him. And a lot of people put up blockages to him uh, uh, ever reaching any kind of high levels within the church. Now, Palladius came and it failed. And Patrick, again, you know, at this stage, uh, would have made one last effort to get in, basically saying something along the lines, uh, look, no one else is going to be able to do this job. If it's going to be done by anybody, it's going to be done by me. I can speak their language. Uh, I know people over there. I, I, I know how to get on with them. I know the way they things work there. 
and it worked. He was sent. Now, what was his job? Well, his primary role was to align the Christian community in Ireland with Rome, because as we, as I, as I pointed out to you there, at this stage there was a mishmash of Christians within Ireland at a time when Rome was trying to assert its domination uh, and to. Uh, if you like, require that people align themselves with Rome. So the last thing Rome wanted uh, was a Christian community establish, establishing itself in Ireland, which was outside of the Roman Empire. And I'll get back to that in a moment, because Ireland was never part of the Roman Empire. So they didn't want a Christian community anywhere that could challenge the dominance of Rome. So it was a strategic sending Patrick there. That was his job. We often uh, it's often said in some books that he was sent to Ireland to strengthen the local Irish Christian community. So you have to read between the lines to figure out what they were saying. And as I said, the community was a mix of converted Irish, Christian slaves, Christian refugees and asylum seekers. So he spent about 20 years preparing for his, his role in the church. Because of his uh, missing out on his education, he was initially assigned to the role as a brother. He finally was made a priest and then made a bishop as a result of his successful, you know, pleading his case to be sent to Ireland. Now, the issue was, as I said, uh, in two years before or two or three years before Patrick arrived, St. Germanus had been sent to Britain with a deal. Now, part of that deal, uh, Rome had to recognize certain things about the ecclesiastical authorities in Britain. And one of the things that Rome uh, agreed with them was that if they were ever to send somebody to Ireland, uh, they would have to get approval from the ecclesiastical authorities in Britain. Now, even though that was only a kind of rubber stamping operation in one sense, it did give them a certain amount of power and Patrick had to go and meet and put his case and get rubber stamped to come to Ireland. Uh, so in, 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 at one level, the British ecclesiastical authorities were able to claim then that uh, because of their intermediary position or whatever, that they, in fact, were the ones who were in control of Patrick and his mission in Ireland. To give you an idea of what was involved in his work, when he arrived in any community in Ireland, he brought with him a group consisting of never less than two dozen people, often up to 100. Now, the group would include an assistant bishop, a chaplain, several men that Patrick was preparing for a priesthood, a brehan or judge to advise him on legal matters, builders, masons, smiths, metal workers, chariot and wagon drivers, a cook, and most importantly, a brewer, and two table attendants, and also a sacristan, three embroidery workers to prepare, prepare the linens, and a palmist. Now, it's thought that he supplemented his church resources with some personal and family wealth, although we're not sure about that. But we do know, and he uh, says it himself in his work, that wealthy Irish nobility, particularly women, provided resources for his work. And this was something that got him into trouble with the uh, ecclesiastical authorities in, 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 in England. Uh, because when he was, um, when they confronted him about it, he basically said, I never took anything from them. Uh, but that's not what the ecclesiastical authorities wanted. They basically wanted them to take it and they wanted them to divvy it up with them because their problem with Patrick in, in Ireland eventually was that uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't sending revenue over to them. Um, he was using it uh, to build his mission in Ireland and they did not like that. Anyway, uh, there's a couple of people uh, that you might have read. One is Cal who wrote the book, uh, How the Irish Saved Civilization. So he again, tells us because of Patrick's knowledge of the Irish language and culture, that that was what was on his CV, if you like, uh, that allowed him to be sent. Um, also, he started in Northern Ireland. And one of the reasons for that uh, was that the other uh, Christian ministers that I mentioned earlier on, Declan and Kieran and the rest, they were located in the south. And they were not that happy with Patrick uh, coming. They did not like an outsider being imposed on them. Um, so when when Patrick went to particularly to Munster and Leinster, he could only go by permission and by invitation, uh, because as far as they were concerned, this is our territory. Um, so there was internal squabblings uh, in Ireland at the time. Now, he would have got and sought permission from local kings uh, to minister to Christians in a given area. Uh, because at this time, um, all the land was owned by the, by clans. You know, so if once you landed and, and set foot on land in Ireland, you were on somebody's land. 
So you have to get permission uh, to do your work. Otherwise, you could end up losing everything. Um, he, he would have sought assistance of local kings then to move beyond the tribal borders uh, using you know, family connections or whatever. Um, he also converted some uh, kings. At this stage, there would have been about 150 kings in Ireland because it was those kings at a local level, uh, at a slightly higher level, then you know at a provincial level. There were there, were, there was a whole uh, there was a whole hierarchy of kings. Another book uh, was written by Freeman, who suggested Patrick succeeded by using a slow and steady approach with a careful eye on the practical politics of Irish society. And what that means is things like making payments to local kings to gain their favour and protection. Um, and we know that that's true because Patrick tells us he knew that that's what you had to do. And again, the ecclesiastical authorities in Britain did not like that. Um, he chose not to be confrontational, confrontational or dogmatic. And above all, he wanted to demonstrate that Christian morality and principles uh, worked and that he applied them. Uh, because there were many people in Ireland who were just waiting for this whole thing uh, to collapse some way or another. Uh, they were waiting for him to make a mistake. Um, so he had to be very careful and he, he knew that he was being scrutinised. Now, we know that Patrick, along with other Christian missionaries, they managed to spread Christian teachings through things like preaching, uh, writing and performing countless baptisms. Now, one of the things that helped him in this spread was the fact that the pagan uh, religions uh, already related to transcendentalism. So, again, in explaining um, the transcendental element, you know, of the, the church, it wasn't a, it wasn't a concept that was new to the Irish. So he was able to, uh, you know, to he understood how we could use that. He also recognized the history of spiritual practices in place in Ireland, the kind of nature oriented rituals. And a lot of those were incorporated into church practices. And one of the most obvious ways that we see that today is in Patrick's Celtic Cross. It's renowned for coming up. He, you know, he combined native sun worshipping with the Christian. So that meant to people, you know, he, he is not trying to wipe out our history uh he's incorporating uh that now there are accounts uh, unfortunately that patrick uh did consign to the flames uh, 150 volumes of written works belonging to the pagans and i along with many other people would love to see what was in those sad day when those were burnt so what were his achievements? Well, he established bishops throughout the northern, central and eastern Ireland. As I said, he was restricted from going to uh, Munster in the south. He structured the church uh, then by locating bishops close to the sites of provincial kings. Uh, the borders of diocese then had to be arranged to correspond with boundaries of the petty kingdoms. So again, what he had to do there was um, in, in, instead of taking out a map and deciding where the, di the diocese would be, he, he essentially had to accept that whatever lines I draw on this are the lines that are already there. The effect of this then was that every clan had to have their own uh, church, they had to have their own priests. And the tradition in Ireland was any important positions had to be hereditary. Um, and in this case, uh, over time, uh, it was the same within the, within the, within the church, and uh, that then became a problem for Rome for hundreds and hundreds of years, trying to back out of of that. Um, now he himself was the primatial or the highest ranking bishop in Ireland, seated at Armagh, um, and the claim that Armagh has to be the primary seat within Ireland. Uh, has always rested then after that with the fact that Armagh uh, was the centre set up by Patrick because Cashel and Dublin at different times uh, fought and wanted to be the centre and the, the seat, you know, of, of Ireland. You know, so even to today, you have a situation where the Archbishop of Dublin um, is known as the Archbishop of Ireland. And uh, in Armagh, he's the Archbishop of all Ireland. So again, the finer points of this, I'd love to go into it in detail with you sometime, but uh, it, it, it took hundreds of years for, uh, for, for the people in Munster to accept that it wasn't going to be Cashel, 
because that was where they were um, hoping would be accepted as the primary uh, seat uh, in Ireland. And it took hundreds of years for them to agree to Armagh. Then hundreds of years after that, again, then Dublin, uh, after Dublin City was developed, uh, Dublin wanted that role. And again, that was fought out for a long time, too. Now, one of the significant things about uh, about it was that there were no church martyrs at this time, which is very, very unusual. Now, at the same time, um, the threat was always there because Patrick says himself that on more than one occasion, he eludes the persecution. He declares that he expects martyrdom and he welcomes the prospect. And in the first four or five centuries uh, in, in Europe, uh, Christians expected martyrdom and a lot of them welcomed it because they knew that martyrdom meant uh, instant, uh, an instant uh, reward in terms of ending up in heaven. That was what they believed. Now, it's clear that by the time of his death, uh, so he, he arrived in Ireland when he was around 46, 47, and he died uh, 72 or 73. So he had about 25 years. So he hadn't succeeded in converting the whole of Ireland, uh, nor in, 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 in reconciling all of the secular authorities to Christianity. Now, the main Christian narrative of Ireland is that by the time that he died, that he had achieved all of that, but it's, it's not the case. Again, it was a simplification, but, you know, I tried to teach history. Um, he supported in his work church officials. He created councils. He founded monasteries. And he did organize Ireland into dioceses. Um, but again, the dioceses were essentially boundaries that he wasn't able to impose upon people. Um, one of the effects of his work was that by the sixth century, uh, there were church laws laid down. And laid on a code of conduct for Christians towards their pagan neighbours. So it wasn't uh, like we have to convert everybody or get rid of them. That was not the case. There was respect for uh, for for people, and that was put down as a, in a code of conduct. So according to Cardinal Cushing, within the 25 years, the whole of Ireland was Catholic, uh, which, as I said, wasn't the case. Uh, what is true is that he consecrated 350 bishops. I don't think anyone really disagrees with that. He ordained, ordained over 5,000 priests and he built more than 700 churches. So that would have meant a huge building boom uh, within Ireland and would have had major economic impacts at the time. Now I'm going to look at his writings. Uh, the first writing was its titled A Letter to the Soldiers of Caroticus. Now, Caroticus was a king on the island of, of Britain. And what happened was Patrick had just been up to a place on the northeast coast of Ireland and he had just baptized a whole village and people from the surrounding areas. And he was heading off then somewhere else. And he wasn't gone that long when a messenger caught up with him to notify him that the people that he had uh, just baptized were now taken away by the soldiers of Caroticus to Britain as slaves. So Patrick had to do something about it. Um, he he knew that the I, I, people in Ireland were looking, you know, and this was a, a, in one sense, this was a test to see how we would respond to this. So he wrote a letter to the soldiers and it, it, one of the people who've written about it describes the letter as at once a decree of excommunication, a heartfelt plea, a carefully argued sermon, a word of comfort to his Irish followers and a powerful prayer to God for divine justice. Now, copies were sent not just to Caroticus, but the church leaders in Britain and fellow Christians in, in Ireland. So the issue was uh, this created enormous problems for Patrick. Uh, he was in a, a no win situation. If he if he chose to ignore it and plead that I can't do anything. Well, that wasn't going to go down well uh, with his uh, supporters in, in Ireland. The protocol at the time uh, was that he should have contacted the ecclesiastical authorities in Britain and asked them to intervene. But he knew that that would take too long, first of all, because he knew that within within weeks, all of the people would have been, uh, you know, would have been dispersed throughout the world. Um, so he had a short window, if you like, you know, to, to do something. Um, he also knew quite likely that the local uh, ecclesiastical authorities in the area that um, Caroticus lived in probably relied upon Caroticus for their personal 
security. Uh, so he knew that they were probably not going to do a whole lot about it. So that's why he wrote uh, the letter. And that then developed because uh, from that point, there was already issues about his mission in, you know, in Ireland. And uh, I suppose in one, in one sense, uh, the, the church in England saw him as having gone native. Um, and he wasn't heeding their calls to do things their way. Uh, so he was al already, you know, having having some difficulties that way. This letter then just gave them the opportunity uh, because now he had clearly overstepped the mark. And so they 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 um, they wanted to call him, you know, to account. And, and that's what they did. Uh, sometime later, they called him. Uh, sent him a message calling him back uh, to England for a review. Now, he knew that if he went for that review, that they would never let him back. He was in his 70s and he, you know, it was probably common knowledge at the time that there was somebody already uh, set up to come from Britain to take over. So he refused to go and he wrote a letter and that letter we know today is the Confessio. Um, it's accepted also that uh, it was uh, the work of St. Patrick. And as I said, uh, it, it didn't have a title. Then we know it by the, the final line in the letter, because he writes that the letter is his confessio or confession before death. So here's again the reasons why he wrote it. The church were angry over the letter to the soldiers. Um, he was called back to England for a review. His character and work were attacked viciously. Uh, he was accused of corruption, of having ulterior motives in coming to Ireland. Uh, was stated to be unfit for the job, and that was because of his um, lack of, you know, the education. In, in other words, his Latin was not of, of the standard that was normally required within the church. Uh, his uh, debating skills, his oratorical skills, uh, his knowledge of the history of the, the church, there was, a, you know, quite a lot that he had missed out on, obviously. So also they saw him as uh, being too close to the Irish. In other words, he had gone native and they called him a filthy little pig keeper. That's what. So anyway, the story, essentially, to give it to you in a nutshell, it's a selective story and it's designed to show that he was chosen by the grace of God to serve selflessly among the Irish. And he recounts his boyhood, his slavery, his escape, his dreams, the threats, temptations, all of that are included uh, to convince the readers that he, like the Apostle Paul, was selected by God and guided by him in his work. And he says that uh, very well in this here. And, and this, uh, you, you could read through this and pick out an awful lot. And I'll explain some of it as I go through. So he says, listen to me well, all of you, great and small, everyone who has any fear of God, especially you wealthy landowner, landowners, so proud of your education. So he's getting a dig in there because their problem with him was his lack of education. He says, listen and consider carefully. God chose foolish little me from among all of you who seem so wise and so expert in the law and so powerful in your eloquence. He picked ignorant Patrick ahead of all of you, even though I am not worthy. He picked me to go forth with fear and reverence and without any of you complaining at the time to serve the Irish faithfully. So he was saying there at the end uh, about the complaining at the time. What he was saying was that you guys, you know, you didn't give me a chance of success. You thought I'd be dead within weeks or that uh, like uh, Palladius, that I would be running scared and out of that country before the day was done. And now that I've been successful, you want to to, uh, to basically take it all from me. So he died um, in, in Saul, in Downpatrick. Uh, it wasn't called Downpatrick when he was alive. Um, it, that didn't happen until the Normans uh, came to Ireland. And a fellow called uh, John de Courcy took over uh, the northeast coast of Ireland. And in taking it over, uh, he uh, did some things that put him in the bad books of the, uh, the church. Uh, like he kidnapped people from the church, um, took him into captivity um, and eventually released him. But anyway, he decided he had to make amends. And what he did was he, he, he decided uh, on this area, um, and uh, which, which was where it was reputed that Patrick had been buried, um, and he called it after Patrick, down Patrick. 
and then he sent out people to you know to get uh, any uh, any uh, you know the the the, the, the the relics, if you like, of St. Bridget and St. Columba and put them all together. And this was his kind of gift to the church uh, to make amends. And it worked. So I'm going to now go into some of the St. Patrick's Day celebrations and his legacy. Um, so I'm going to give them uh, essentially uh, in a kind of a chronological uh, order. So the first thing we know is that when, when he was here in 441, uh, he went on a 40 day a night a pilgrimage on what was called Eagle Mountain in County Mayo at the time. Now it's called Croke Patrick after him, but it was Eagle Mountain for ever before that. Um, and every year, thousands of Christians make the ascent, some barefoot, to commemorate the original pilgrimage. Now, the, the celebrations then, as far as we know, began in the ninth century. Uh, by Irish scholars who travelled uh, to the continent, and they are the ones that are credited with starting it. Now, many of these were fleeing Ireland uh, as the Viking invasion started and continued, and they arrived in Europe as refugees and asylum seekers. And Patrick then became a symbol of Ireland for all of those in exile. Uh, we know that when the Vikings invaded Ireland, they attacked the, all of the, uh, the church properties, the monasteries, settlements, kidnapping people to sell as slaves, taking mobile wealth and destroying the Christian heritage. Um, the Vikings, uh, one of their main, main motivations for that was because, uh, you know, um, we had Charlemagne, uh, who was the king of France, and he was given the job as the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And one of his first tasks was to Christianize the rest of Europe. And he basically came out with an edict. And the edict uh, to people in Western Europe was, you've got two choices. Uh, one is conversion and the other is execution. The Vikings were not happy with that. And that to a large extent explains why the Vikings, uh, when they came to Ireland and various other parts where there was a Christian tradition, it explains why they set about destroying that Christian tradition. Now, very, very shortly after they came in, because Ireland wasn't an urban uh, society. So you had to find places where people gather in large numbers. And they realized pretty quick that there were certain days of the year where people gathered in large numbers to celebrate their saints, like Patrick, like Bridget and the rest. And uh, the Vikings then realized that uh, they could raid those places. And they did, making off uh, at times with thousands of Irish for the slave markets. Now, many Christians left Ireland for the safety of Europe. And then an annual tradition sprung up amongst them. And in the ninth century in Ireland itself, there was an annual three day observance of the anniversary of the death uh, of St. Patrick. And there was a, a readings then which were uh, read and continued over the three days. Then uh, his feast day was placed on the universal liturgical calendar in the Catholic Church. Uh, due to the influence of Luke Wadding, who was a Franciscan scholar. And this was in the early 1600s. And St. Patrick's Day then became a holy day of obligation for Roman Catholics in Ireland. It's also a feast day in the Church of Ireland, which is part of the Anglican Communion. Now, until the 1700s, St. Patrick's Day was celebrated predominantly in Ireland, but there were other parts of Europe where it was a somber religious occasion spent mainly in prayer and not a drop of drink anywhere. From the 18th century onward, uh, then as a result of the penal laws in Ireland, some Irish people began to use St. Patrick's Day as a means of promoting Irish culture and tradition. Essentially, it was an act of defiance because during the penal laws, uh, essentially, if you were Irish, you were criminalized. And any, any action or any activity uh, that showed that you wanted to celebrate your history and your culture um, could could lose, you could lose your life over it. But because St. Patrick was common, you know, to the various churches, uh, it was one of those uh, uh, situations where they were able to take advantage of it. Um, and the, the authorities had to kind of, you know, look at it and uh, ignore it, essentially. But for the Irish people, it was a way in which they could display an act of defiance against the English. And they began wearing shamrocks because, again, at the time, uh, any if, if you wore any symbol um, related to Ireland, you could lose your freedom of your life. But again, because it was St. Patrick's Day, they began wearing the shamrock and they, be, they were able to get away with it. 
Now, the colour green then was further associated with Ireland from the 1640s when the green harp flag was used by the Irish Catholic Confederation, uh, which ruled Ireland for um, about eight or nine years in the 1640s. Uh, green ribbons and shamrocks then have been worn on St. Patrick's Day since at least the 1680s. And then the Friendly Brothers of St. Patrick, uh, which is an Irish fraternity that was founded in 1750, they adopted green as its colour because the original colour associated with Patrick was actually blue. Then in 1903, St. Patrick's Day became an official public holiday in Ireland. Uh, under the Bank Holiday Act of 1903, it was introduced. Also, the person who introduced it, uh, James O'Mara, he later introduced a law which required that public houses be shut on 17th of March after the drinking got out of hand. But by the 70s, that had to be repealed because people wanted to drink again. Then parades, well, the first St. Patrick's Day parade in Ireland was held in Waterford in 1903. And then in 1916, uh, some of you will know that in 1916, we had the Easter Rebellion. Um, so again, as happened, uh, you know, during the penal law times, people had to find, uh, I suppose, an imaginative and innovative way in which you could actually get out onto the streets and parade and show your Irishness. So uh, in 1916, the Irish volunteers, uh, that led the Easter Rebellion, uh, they held parades throughout Ireland, but got away with them on the basis that they were celebrating St. Patrick. And the authorities recorded 38 St. Patrick's Day parades involving 6,000 marchers, and almost half of them were said to have been armed. The first official state-sponsored St. Patrick's Day parade in Dublin took place in 1931. And then in terms of, uh, you know, uh, this side of the world, um, Obviously, Irish emigrants uh, brought St. Paddy's Day to the United States. Uh, it is said that the first civic and public celebration of St. Patrick's Day took place in Boston in 1737. Now, some recent research suggests that the, the world's first recorded St. Patrick's Day celebration was in St. Augustine in the year 1600. And that's according to uh, research that's been done by Dr. Michael Franisis. Uh, he discovered the first St. Patrick's Day parade was also in St. Augustine in 1601. Uh, both were organised by the Spanish colony's Irish vicar, Ricardo Arthur or Richard Arthur. Many believe still that the first meeting of Irishmen on American soil to honour St. Patrick took place in Boston on the, on the 17th of March in 1737. And then Boston had its first parade in 1812. Now, it was in New York City that the first parade uh, took place, and it took place in 1762 when Irish soldiers that were serving with the British Army marched through Manhattan to a local tavern. Uh, now, the first celebration of St. Patrick's Day in, in New York City was held at the Crown and Thistle Tavern in 1756. And in 1780, uh, General George Washington um, who commanded soldiers of Irish descent in the Continental Army, he allowed his troops a holiday on March the 17th. That event became known as the St. Patrick's Day Encampment of 1780. Now known as the uh, Evacuation Day, March 17, 1776, it saw the withdrawal of British troops and loyalists from the Boston Harbour after a siege for 11 months. Now Washington's general orders for the day set the password and countersign for safe re-entry into the city as Boston, and St. Patrick. So by the late 1860s, over a dozen American cities had large St. Patrick's Day parades. And then just 10 years later, the Irish by the 1870s were the majority in the population of New York. And obviously, not surprisingly, uh, it was largely due to the American Day celebration world. Um, it's where the Irish connection is, is slight. Now, one of the um, I suppose one of the events that happened uh, that, uh, you know, just signifies so much ill will and whatever had to do with St. Patrick's Crozier. Uh, in Irish, it's known as Anbacal Isa. It was made of wood and legend tells us that it was given to him uh, when he was uh, when he was in the Holy Land. And it was given to him. Uh, and, and the legend is that it was actually a staff that uh, uh, that Jesus Christ had used himself. Um, now, some of the ancient books in Ireland, like the Annals of Ulster and the Annals of the Four Masters, say it was a symbol of Patrick's 
authority. Um, now, he himself then uh, took the original uh, 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 piece of wood and he had uh, an elaborate casing made for it by his companion, uh, the goldsmith Asicus, who then became a saint afterwards, Saint Tussock. So uh, eventually this, uh, in, uh, you know, because initially it was just a, a staff of just wood and over time then it, uh, it got upgraded, if you like. So it was described by the famous Saint Bernard of Clairvaux as it, it was covered with gold and adorned with the most costly gems. And it was a national relic uh, and uh, things like oaths and treaties then were signed on it. Um, and it did, it survived for a long time. It, su it survived storms, it survived the Viking invasions. But then during the Reformation, it was sacrilegiously destroyed in Dublin. It was taken out of uh, Christ Church and it was burnt in public in front of the church in Dublin. Just one or two lines. The only nation then outside of Ireland that celebrates uh, St. Patrick's Day as a national holiday is Montserrat. Uh, in the West Indies, um, was first populated by Irish and African slaves, uh, deported there beginning in the 1650s. It's nicknamed the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean because of its physical shape, which some say resembles Ireland, and of course, because of its Irish heritage. You can get movies about St. Patrick uh, by searching online. I've got some of them listed here. There's also a kid's movie. And I'll take any questions or any comments that uh, any of you have. Sean, that was really, really wonderful. So if anybody wants to put a question into the chat, please go ahead and do so. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, when you mentioned Crow Patrick, it reminded me about, oh, close to 20 years ago now, my wife was over in Ireland and she and she ascended it um, and was left with not only an impression of a great view when she reached the top, but like odd that some people climb it barefoot. Yes. Um, <laughs> it just uh, such an amazing thing. Um, I was curious, actually, for myself, uh, Palladius, uh, you mentioned as someone who failed in his attempt when going to Ireland. I was curious uh, how many attempts did they make and maybe some of the reasons why he failed. It seemed that maybe part of it was to do with um, St. Patrick knowing the language and Palladius just maybe not having the same level of preparation. Yeah, it, it, it was partly that, but also Patrick, you know, having been a slave in Ireland, he had a different approach on life. You know, he was more hands on. Uh, one of the movies um, that was made in 1999 about St. Patrick, which is well worth listening. It, it's a Hollywood movie, um, but it it, 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 it it does a few things that are good. And one of them is about St. Palladius. And what it shows is, you know, St. Palladius, you know, coming in in all his attire, you know, getting off the boat with all these servants around him. And uh, then he has to walk up to where the Irish are and his feet are getting mucky and he's looking down and he's getting disgusted with all of this. And the Irish are just laughing at him, you know, and and basically, you know, that, that was it. He was not a person that they could ever relate, uh, you know, to. Um, so uh, so the story is anyway that he didn't get on with the Irish people. He didn't get on with the Christians that were there and he gave up and had to be replaced. That's, you know, the, the, there are different stories, you know, because, again, we, you know, we can't go back to look at the headlines in the papers or uh, but that certainly, you know, looks like what happened. That's the most uh, that's the, the story that's told most. Some people actually say that Palladius did stay 10 or 20 years in, in Ireland and then Patrick came later. But it, there's really the evidence doesn't support that as far as I'm concerned. Mm, interesting. Um, I was I was also curious about the confessio. Um, it seemed like it was very politically kind of a uh, a thing that maybe the uh, church wasn't excited about being out there. And is that the right? Am I getting the right impression? Um, that well, the, the problem was, uh, you know, the the you know the Roman Church could, couldn't ignore the fact that you know this island uh, you know, had now a substantial you know and, and a growing. Uh, Christian population as a result of the, uh, you know, the, essentially the Germanic tribes coming in and the, you know, the, the Roman Empire uh, being under siege. So a lot of them were going there because it was a safe place uh, to go, relatively safe anyway. Um, so 
the fact that Ireland had never been part of the Roman Empire would have meant that no one had prioritized going to Ireland. So the fact that uh, a decision was taken to send somebody there uh, is proof positive, you know, that there was substantial you know, activity going on in Ireland that required that form of intervention. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. Uh, you know, it was a totally different intervention than was happening you know, throughout Europe. So there were there were there were concerns that, uh, um, particularly given that uh, in, in numbers of people had been forced out of Britain by the British ecclesiastical authorities, because there were still battles going on over things like original sin, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, and also uh, the, the the Christian group that uh, that essentially were active in Britain, or at least some of them. Um, you know, were ones who were not happy with the way that the Christian church was developing across Europe because it was it was centered among the elites. Mm. And, 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 and what they were basically saying was we don't actually need to go down and get our feet dirty. All we have to do is to go to these big dinners, uh, you know, convince all these people with power to become Christians. And they just tell all of their workers and all of the people who are working on their lands, you're now a Christian. Mm. And, you know, whereas... Uh, you know, a, a lot of people saw that as a total uh, destruction of the basic Christian ideal, because the Christian ideal was from just basically ordinary people who went out, you know, and got themselves, you know, martyred for hundreds of years. And now there's all these people, you know, in, in very, very powerful positions, you know, within the Roman Empire. And, and again, if you look at the history of the Roman Empire, I mean, who killed Jesus Christ? You know, who was responsible for his death? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there was a lot of stuff uh, going on uh, that made people unsure about. And of course, in Ireland, the issue as well was, is this is this Rome coming in the back door? You know, we've we've managed for hundreds of years to ensure that the Roman armies never made it, uh, you know, to Ireland. And now we have this new formed, you know, thing emanating from Rome that's coming in and telling us how to think and how to believe. You know, so again, there was, you know, there were substantial issues there in, in, in terms of how you could manage to convert Ireland, you know, given the historic antagonism that would have been to, to, to Rome. Mm. But unfortunately, we don't have enough material to explain how that transitioned and how it transitioned in such a, a short period of, of, of time. It, it does lead credence to the fact that there must have been a lot of people coming in from Europe who are Christians and a lot of people with resources um, uh, who, who were able to use those resources uh, to to get a lot of the local chieftains in Ireland on their sides and get them because that system seems to have worked well in Ireland. You know, if you convert the local chieftains, uh, there was a more symbiotic relationship in Ireland between the clan chieftains and the members of the clan. And to some extent, for a clan chieftain to accept Christianity, there would have had to be in a kind of a process that would have required that they get the approval, you know, of their people for that. Mm. So it wasn't like what was happening, you know, in, in, in typically in Rome, where the, you know, the, the, the leaders of society could adopt it and then essentially then dictate to people. In Ireland, it was different, you know, because you couldn't take the chance that <laughs> that your your clan would disown you, you know. So you had to make sure you had them on board. And then you did mention uh, the hereditary nature of some of that. You said was a bit of an issue too. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> you know, in 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 Ireland, um, it, it well well it, under the old Celtic system, essentially there was a, there was an approach that you know there were a very very important jobs that needed to be done. Um, and uh, the way to ensure that those got done uh, was was, to, was to, to have those jobs in families for generations after generations. Uh, and so those families then re relied, you know, for their prestige, uh, you know, for their, you know, for their continued existence upon doing a good job. Um, and you had a huge, you had a huge responsibility, you know, to ensure, um, you know, whether whether it was in the field of, of law, whether it was in the the sciences, whatever field it was in, and the same with the druids, you know, the the, the you know the, the leaders of the druids as well, you know, there was this kind of continuity, uh, which was not something that you know Rome wanted. 
because again they, they wanted to break up local structures so mm-hmm. that they could control it from the corporate headquarters. Sure. Sure. Yeah.